Well, this is uh, too much too soon, but I, I do appreciate it. Alzheimer's disease, isn't it scary? Where, what is it and where does it come from? Has anybody ever heard of dementia? Yeah. It, it so happens that a fellow, a doctor by the name of, I think if I get it right, a Louis Alzheimer, I think he was French, described uh, a dementia that was happening in somebody that was young. Maybe we could turn that down a little bit. It's got a terrible echo. Thank you. And nobody liked the sound of the, the word dementia, the thought of it. He, what he called Alzheimer's, or what was called Alzheimer's, was pre-senile dementia. What happens when you begin to lose your marbles? Is that the right way to say it? Early, not, not at, at old age, but really a little bit younger. The initial woman that he uh, presented to the medical community was 50 years of age. And that sounds a little young for getting dementia, right? So it was called Alzheimer's dementia. <clears throat> dementia had a lot of kind of negative emotional connotations, and so it didn't take long when, uh, until the whole medical community and the folks in the, in the patients and just the general public decided to call dementia Alzheimer's because it's nice to put somebody's name to it rather than calling it dementia. You hate to say you're losing your mind if you can say this has a syndrome. So it's come to, men, uh, to mean quite a bit more. And it fills the hearts of many of us with fear. As our hair turns gray, we worry my grandmother, Grandma Guthrie. She was always worried about being in a nursing home and chewing on her tongue. That was her biggest concern in life. My wife has already given very clear instructions. When she loses her mind, I'm to place her in a nursing home, visit her every day, and put rubber cement on her fingers. She loves to pick it. <laughs> so this is a kind of a fearful thing for all of us. The science is telling us that there's some parts of dementia that are preventable, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I will lead you through what we know about it, and we don't know all about it, we just know some things about it, and then I'll begin to show you some of the science as what we know that we can do to prevent the disease. Fair enough? So let's go first to uh, what is it? Well, <clears throat> we mentioned uh, Dr. Alzheimer, and my notes tell me he was... Uh, German. Okay, I got the French wrong. So he was a German fella, and I guess that sounds more like Alzheimer. What happens is uh, the brain changes. There are little sticky proteins called amyloid within the cells. These cells kind of uh, are gummed up and begin to die. The other thing that we see when we look at the brains of people who have died with Alzheimer's disease, is something called neurofibrillary tangles. And it's just, there's little <clears throat> strands kind of all knotted up together. The brain cells have begun to die, and many of them have died. In particular, it is the uh, brain cells that make a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. If it happens down in the base of the brain, you begin to lose your memory. If it happens up in the cortex or the top of the brain, it might be a problem with uh, speech or, or judgment that happens. So sometimes the uh, uh, dementia or the, the way it uh, sh shows up is not, all, uh, is not completely consistent in everybody. Some people may lose, for example, the ability to, for, to judge things. Some people may lose their memory. That's, that's uh, kind of the, the big concern. Uh, estimated 5.1 million cases in the United States at this point. Uh, there's a picture from the pathologist, the microscope slide, 
beta amyloid. That's that kind of sticky protein, and you can see it. If I remember correctly, it's silver stained. And uh, it, it, over there on the right-hand side, especially, you can see the, the tangles. Um, here's uh, a little, the neurofibrillary tangles with the little tau proteins that kind of mess it up, and, and that's uh, the stain on, on the right. Now, this is a bit of a challenge, right? Because we make the diagnosis on autopsy. How do we get into somebody's brain when they're still alive? Well, we don't. We have to look for clinical uh, changes. And indeed, uh, that's what happens. You can also see, and th th sometimes the MRI or CT scan can show this, uh, <clears throat> you begin to see the brain, the, the convolutions on the outside of the brain shrink. So uh, it starts to get smaller, and you can begin to see uh, on the brain on the right hand side for sure that the sulci or those those folds of the brain are beginning to get smaller leaving the spaces larger and that's something that we can see uh, on the CT or the MRI scan well <clears throat> the warning signs that's what we're all worried about right That's why pastor Morris couldn't remember exactly why he was here when he came to me I said what am I supposed to lecture on <laughs> Well, probably the most uh, Im commonly understood one is this memory loss, especially memory loss of recent events, names, and you know, where did I put those things? Uh, or other new information. Often, the memory of what has happened in the past is crystal clear, and people who are beginning to have Alzheimer's can remember clearly what happened in the past. Uh, it's the kind of new uh, information that is lost. Now, let's be careful. <clears throat> Just because you can't find your keys <laughs> does not mean you have Alzheimer's. It, it, some of that is considered normal, uh, especially for people like me. Right? <laughs> and, and you may lose your keys occasionally. Uh, please, uh, you don't have to feel like you have Alzheimer's. One of the odd things about Alzheimer's disease is most people who have it don't know they have it. If you're aware that I'm, I'm not being able to find my keys, it's very likely that the, uh, you don't have it or it, it, it's extremely early. Here's another one, confusion about time and place. You know, where am I? What time is it? Struggling to complete familiar actions, such as brushing the teeth or getting dressed. So that begins to slip. <clears throat> Trouble finding appropriate words. Uh, completing sentences and following directions and conversations. Of course, this is a progressive disease. People progress in different areas at uh, uh, different speeds. Poor judgment, especially when it involves the frontal Lobe. This is where we make our decisions, especially in the, uh, what we call the cortex or the outer uh, layers. A change in mood and personality, such as increased suspicion, rapid and persistent mood swings, withdrawal, and disinterest in the usual activities. My mother's mother came down with Alzheimer's disease. And it's not uncommon for this suspicion. She just knew Grandpa was stealing her underwear. <laughs> and poor Grandpa, you know, it was, it was so hard for him. The person that he'd lived with all his life and had, had had a good relationship, now she began to accuse him of things that were really kind of silly, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, these types of things happened as the uh, brain disappears. Difficulty with complex mental assignments, such as balancing the checkbook or other uh, tasks that involve numbers. So this is kind of a, a general uh, list, we might say. Uh, so if you see these types of things happening in a loved one, it's very unlikely that you're going to see them in yourself. It is occasional. Some people have enough insight to be able to say, I can tell it's happening, but most do not. It's something you're going to see in somebody else. Of course, we'd like to know uh, how to diagnose it. We can do an MRI and see the brain shrinking, but we don't do brain biopsies. 
So what we often use is something called the uh, mini mental status exam. And maybe you've uh, had these questions asked you by your doctor. Uh, <clears throat> just humor your doctor a bit, if you will. I would say, what year is it, what season, what month, what date, what day? And you get one point for each one of those. Can you answer those? I'll bet everybody here can. Do you know what state you're in, what city, what part of the city, what building, and what floor you're on? One point for each of those. These aren't hard questions, are they? No. Immediate word recall. Generally, we would give somebody three words to remember. You know, a pencil, a dog, and a house. Can you say those back? Pencil, dog, house. And then we'll actually come back later after we do another one and ask you that pencil, dog, or was that cat? House. <coughs> Serial seven subtractions. So you start with a hundred, subtract seven. Subtract seven, subtract seven. You do that five times, you get one point for each time that you do it. Another way of doing this, if you'd like to try it, some people have a hard time with the math, and you can spell world backwards. That one will do the same. So that counts. And then <coughs> delayed recall. That is, we ask for those first three things back again. So if you can remember those after doing another task with your brain, then that part of the brain is working well. Then, you know, hold up a pencil or a, uh, uh, a pen. Just show a couple uh, items to the person and ask them to name the objects. You know, what's this? It's a tie or a shirt or whatever. And then follow directions, three steps. Generally, we'll say, and there, it's often uh, written down, fold the paper in half uh, and put it on the floor. Maybe write something on it. So simple instructions. Can you follow and do them? And then <coughs> read, close your eyes, <laughs> and then actually do it. So when someone reads it and they're supposed to do it, read this and do it. And then uh, <coughs> writing, that is to write, just write a sentence. And then drawing two pedagons that overlap. Uh, I don't think I have them. But you know, a pentagon is a five shaped, and generally what we do is the doctor will do one and then say, make him another one just like that. So <clears throat> that is uh, the way it all, uh, that's kind of the test. If you add all the questions up, you'll find out that you, there's a total of about 29 points. And if you can get uh, anything between 25 and 29, you're okay. <laughs> you can still miss one and be okay. When you start getting below 24, less than 24, then we say there's mild impairment, and then uh, you can see uh, uh, moderate is 10 to 14, and then severe impairment is below. So that's the test that the doctors usually use. So <clears throat> if uh, the doctor asks you the question, the questions, uh, enjoy the little quiz, okay? You can even study for it if you'd like. I've had patients do that. It's okay. <laughs> you can practice subtracting sevens or spelling world backwards. Um, you might even suggest three things you'd like to remember. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> Just, it tells us your brain is working. What causes Alzheimer's disease? I mean, that's kind of the big question, isn't it? Is it something that we have to get? I remember in the uh, Bible, the story of Moses, remember he died on the top of, was it Mount Nebo? Uh, his eye was perfectly clear, his brain was sharp, everything was working well. That's the way I'd like to live, right? And I would like to live well all the way to the end. If, if we can find out where Alzheimer's comes from, we may be able to maybe avoid it. Well, <clears throat> the brain, it ends up we thought for years it did not make insulin. You've heard of insulin, right? It's made of the pancreas. It goes to the tissues unless the tissues know you need to take energy into, the, into those tissues. Well, we have thought for years because of type 1 diabetics, if they didn't get their insulin, their brain would still take the sugar in. So we said, well, the brain does not need insulin. 
Several years ago, we discovered that the brain makes its own insulin. Remember, every cell in the body has the full genetic capacity for, to be anything and everything. So the brain can make the insulin, any cell could, I suppose, but the brain is designed to make that insulin. And that insulin works locally. It doesn't depend on the insulin made in the pancreas. Uh, fascinating little uh, uh, tidbit. Levels of insulin receptors in the brain tend to decrease with Alzheimer's disease. Low levels of insulin receptors impair the brain's ability to respond to insulin. Those of you that were here and heard the talk about diabetes, you remember something about insulin resistance? The cells start to say no to the insulin. When the brain cells start to say no to the insulin that is made inside the brain, then the changes that we have identified, these neurofibrillary uh, tangles and the amyloid, sticky amyloid proteins, start to happen in the cells. The cells begin to die. That's fascinating, isn't it? Insulin is associated with acetylcholine production. I shared with you that acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, the, the kind of brain talking hormone that tends to die out as we get Alzheimer's disease. There are uh, a couple, three, or several neurotransmitters. The, uh, uh, maybe you've heard of uh, dopamine. It's the uh, kind of pleasure type of uh, hormone if, if one takes, for example, a drug to get high or chocolate or <laughs> it's dopamine that goes up in your brain that says, ooh, this is nice. And then another one is serotonin, which is kind of the happy hormone. If your serotonin is low, you may get depressed. Uh, acetylcholine is kind of a, a basic action type of, of a, a neurotransmitter within the brain. And we've found that Insulin tends to increase acetylcholine production inside the cells. So if the cells are getting insulin resistant, one would expect the acetylcholine to begin to go down. And indeed, that seems to be what happens. So acetylcholine deficiency correlates with Alzheimer's disease. In the most advanced stage of Alzheimer's, the studies show that insulin receptors were 80% lower than in a normal brain. So there's still a little bit there, but there's a decrease in those insulin receptors. Insulin resistant signaling can influence the, uh, the little beta amyloid production in the brain. So now we're getting even closer to understanding a little more about this disease. The, uh, I, I guess it's Dr. Ho that has done this one, diet induced insulin resistance promotes amyloidosis in the transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So they got a bunch of mice, and they give them diabetes, if you will, by giving them too much food, too much energy. They develop this uh, insulin resistance, and their brains, see, we can do these studies on mice. We don't do them on humans. And their brains began to develop these changes. So we're seeing this connection at least in the animals, between, well, <clears throat> I guess, diabetes and Alzheimer's. Now, <clears throat> this is from Dr. Steen. Uh, she is, uh, has been one of the spokesmen about this whole concept. This is a fascinating concept as we wrap it up here. What we found is that insulin is not just produced in the pancreas, but also in the brain. And we discover that insulin and its growth factors, which are necessary for the survival of brain cells, contribute to the progression of Alzheimer's. This raises the possibility of what she calls type 3 diabetes. When your brain gets insulin resistance, it starts to go into Alzheimer's disease. It's a type of, if you will, diabetes. Suzanne De La Monte, a neuropathologist at Rhode Island Hospital and professor at Brown Medical School news release. So this is uh, 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 fascinating little information really about how lifestyle, anything that might cause diabetes might also tend to cause Alzheimer's as well. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir.
probability of having that? Yes, <clears throat> we have seen that that uh, has been demonstrated multiple times. I can think of at least one study done in Israel where they took people with diabetes and looked at Alzheimer later on, and it was almost three times as much Alzheimer's in people with diabetes. It was like 2.83, something like that. So yes, it does tend to go up. What's a normal blood sugar level? What's a normal blood sugar? <clears throat> a normal fasting blood sugar should be less than 100, okay? The two hours after you eat, it should be less than 140, preferably less than 120. So uh, if your blood sugars are down in those levels, you shouldn't be having problems, uh, certainly unless there's medication. Is uh -huh. there any difference on the cause here of whether it's type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Type 1 or type 2 diabetes. What we're talking about is insulin resistance in the brain. Type 1 diabetes doesn't have insulin resistance. It has a dead pancreas. So that shouldn't make any difference. This is more a type 2 correlation. So diabetes of the brain, if you will. Alzheimer's, it looks like it may very well be. <laughs> Alzheimer's is diabetes of the brain. Isn't that weird? It's fascinating. And uh, the neuroscientists uh, are still working on that. This is, uh, and, and I think as we go through this, you'll find that it, uh, does make uh, sense. The epidemiology tells us that 50 to 70 percent of Alzheimer's disease is preventable. That's good news, isn't it? And we're going to spend some time looking at the things that increase our risk of Alzheimer's and things that we might do to kind of help prevent it, if you will. <clears throat> Don't you just love that upper right-hand corner? Am I gone funeral home? <laughs> I don't know where that is, but when I found that, I chuckled. And talking about Alzheimer's disease, look at this bottom one. Illiterate, right for free help. <laughs> uh, age. You can see about one out of eight has Alzheimer's disease at 65 years of age, and one out of two at 85 years of age. So age itself is a risk factor. Now you don't have to get it. Remember, there's half of those who are 85 who don't have it. So <laughs> let's plan to be in that group. Is that fair enough? Now <clears throat> this next one is, is identified as oxidative stress. Do you recognize that term? Maybe you've heard it best as, uh, or first, as free radicals. You know, the, the extra electrons that happen in our bodies. These electrons uh, seem to be a stress on the body. Indeed, when people have diabetes, they have increased oxidative stress. We measure that. And it's not a surprise to us, knowing the connection between diabetes and Alzheimer's, that uh, oxidative stress might also make the brain a little worse. Oxidative stress causes inflammation in the blood vessels, and I inflammation in the blood vessels of the brain are likely to, to uh, make this whole uh, process get worse. Now, <clears throat> here's an interesting one. Selenium. Have you all heard of selenium? Some people talk of it as an antioxidant. I suppose it is, a, in a way. It's very important in the function of uh, something that we call glutathione. Glutathione is an antioxidant like vitamin C that we don't eat. It's something we make. It's made out of three amino acids. Glycine, the shortest one. Um, glutamine, have you heard of that one? Anybody ever heard of monosodium glutamate? That's the one. Okay, and then uh, let me see, the last one, my brain is slipping me here, is uh, cysteine, <clears throat> which is one of the sulfur amino acids. So those three go together to turn into this uh, thing that we call glutathione. Glutathione grabs free electrons, and then it's changed into uh, kind of, it's grabbed that electron. In order to be reactivated, it needs selenium for the little enzyme called glutathione reductase. So low selenium in populations is associated with increased Alzheimer's disease. Where do you find selenium? Do you know? 
Selenium is in plants that are grown in soil with selenium. So it depends on where those uh, plants are grown. For example, grains ha tend to have selenium. Uh, the ones that are noted to have the most is like Brazil nuts. So I know at least one of my colleagues says, get, some, uh, get a, a, a palm full of Brazil nuts and eat them every day to make sure you have enough selenium. If you have too much selenium, that causes problems too. So it's not like a, if a little is good, a lot is better. But having adequate selenium can be uh, protective against uh, the uh, Alzheimer's. Now, fibrinogen is something that we can measure in the blood. Your doctor probably doesn't do this on a regular basis, but fibrinogen is a protein that tends to cause clotting in the blood. So the higher your fibrinogen, the, actually the more likely you are to have Alzheimer's disease, for what that's worth. And uh, that fits with heart disease, by the way, and uh, uh, with diabetes as well. And then the last one that I've listed here is ApoE, another uh, somewhat hereditary uh, protein. You can't do much about it, except stay away from trans fats, which will help to decrease your ApoE. So these are things that are considered or known as risk factors. Before I move to the next slide, any questions about the ones that are listed here? Okay. Oh, there was one. No, glucosamine doesn't fit here. It was a good try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is interesting. The high, if you have high blood pressure, especially the systolic or the top number, that increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that's not a surprise. Those of you who were here when we talked about hypertension, about diabetes, uh, know <coughs> that uh, they're kind of all connected, right? And as insulin goes up, it tends, the blood pressure tends to go up as well. Now, interestingly enough, if the blood pressure is too low, especially the resting heart rate, especially, especially when it's being pushed too low by medications. As we get older, now I, where does older start? Does anybody know? <laughs> 75, 80, 85, when we give blood pressure medicines, we shouldn't be pushing the blood pressure all the way down really, really low. Because if it gets too low, and now where is too low? Well, uh, that's a good question. I don't have a number for you. But we let the blood pressure ride a little bit higher when we reach 80 and 85 and 90, okay? Because if the blood pressure is too low, especially the resting, the lower heart rate, it can increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And I suppose that makes sense, not enough blood flow to the brain and not, maybe not enough oxygen in food. So uh, we need to be careful about that. Yes, ma'am? Doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay? If your blood pressure is naturally low, it does not seem to be a problem. It's especially with those who are taking medication to push their blood pressure down if it goes down too low. For example, my mother-in-law is 92 years of age, and her doctor has said the goal for your blood pressure is between a, like a, around 150 for the top number. That makes sense. We don't want to push it all the way down to 125. It's likely to make her worse. So as uh, we get into those older ages, too low a blood pressure can be a problem. Now, <clears throat> you know, if you were here for the diabetes and, and some of the other things we've talked about, that saturated fat and trans fat can make diabetes worse. And indeed, they increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease as well. What's more? <clears throat> oh. Uh, got a couple more cartoons. You like that one? Babies and children, buy two, get third free. <laughs> okay. And this one on the bottom is, uh, you remember Hansel and Gretel? And the, and the witch and the gingerbread house? Well, uh, Gretel is saying as they're walking away from the gingerbread house and the witch, no thanks, way too many trans fats. <laughs> uh, I, I hope that you have learned, or those of you who have been here, 
how bad the trans fats can be and we'd like to avoid them because they cause all kinds of health uh, challenges, including increasing your risk of Alzheimer's disease. I mentioned the APOA uh, connection. Uh, the uh, trans fats do increase that as well. The uh, MUFA stands for monounsaturated fatty acids. That's like olive oil. We often think of that as a... And then polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those seem to be protective. So you don't want saturated fat, you don't want trans fats. If you're going to be using fats, use those that are unsaturated. And I think the best way to get them is actually in the food. In the mice, the omega-3 fats, when given as a supplement, seem to be protective. Interestingly enough, omega-3s are also protective and helpful for people with diabetes. It's not a surprise to us anymore, is it? Because Alzheimer's in the brain is likely now, it's not 100%, but this is where we're headed now, uh, a type of diabetes in the brain. <clears throat> yes, your cholesterol being high, uh, it, it may, it's, this one is not quite as uh, solid, if you will. A high cholesterol, it seems to be associated, but it's not a strong connection. Even more interesting is this set of drugs called the statins. Have you heard of those, like Pravacol and Lipitor and those types of things? They seem to be protective against Alzheimer's disease. So that's kind of good news. It's, that's something positive about the medication. They not only lower cholesterol, they also decrease inflammation. And it's probably that decrease in inflammation that's giving us some protection against Alzheimer's disease. And believe it or not, the good cholesterol, the HDLs, the higher they are, the more protected you are against Alzheimer's. That's good news, isn't it? So uh, there are some risk factors. Here's another risk factor. <clears throat> Obesity really increases the risk of um, uh, Alzheimer's. For every increase of one in BMI, there is a 36% uh, increase in Alzheimer's disease at age 70 years of age in females only. Okay, This is not in males, but only in females. So if you're going to be gaining weight, every BMI that you go up, you're increasing your risk of diabetes and Alzheimer's. Okay. Uh, every pound you gain is a step towards diabetes, and it appears Alzheimer's. Every pound you lose seems to be a step away, so that's good news. <clears throat> uh, if you have type 2 diabetes, we've mentioned this already, you increase your risk. Oh, <clears throat> there's another one for our Alzheimer's folks. This is a yellow sign. It says, caution. This sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. <laughs> oh, also the bridge is out ahead. Okay. <laughs> In midlife, if, you're, if you have a BMI, if you're obese, have a BMI over 30, if you have hypertension or high cholesterol, you have six times the risk of dementia. So do something about it in midlife. If you don't have gray hair yet, I think that means you're still midlife. I saw a few folks like that here this evening. Smoking, I'll bet you're not surprised about this either. It tends to push down on the brain all around and cause trouble. Oh, here's another uh, great picture. Isn't that a great ad? I think it's from Sweden. Do you recognize the words? They've got this ad set, so the guy, it's an advertisement for cigarettes, and the cigarette is the exhaust pipe for the bus. <laughs> so it's smoking. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of cute. <clears throat> Heliobacter pylori, have you heard of this before? This is the infection that tends to cause stomach ulcers. Another reason to get it taken care of, it increases inflammation in the body and there's an association with increased risk of Alzheimer's. When you increase inflammation in the body, that has to do with those free radicals that we talked about, you're increasing the risk of uh, dementia. So get that one treated as well. 
<clears throat> now we're getting a little personal. Worry and stress also increase free radicals and increase the likelihood that you're going to get Alzheimer's. This is in uh, human uh, epidemiologic studies as well as in uh, mice. So uh, worry and stress tend to increase the risk. And then there's the big question, have you all heard about aluminum? Everybody's worried about using aluminum pots. Well, it's only, the only association is with monomeric aluminum. There's some studies that have been done in Europe looking at uh, elderly populations who are drinking water that has monomeric aluminum in it. Now that's just plain aluminum, not the aluminum stuck together. You do not get this from the pots. You do not have to worry about getting Alzheimer's from aluminum pots. If you're worrying about the set that you used for 20 years, 30 years ago, don't. <laughs> okay, it's just the monomeric aluminum where it's by itself in the water and it seems the higher the level, the more your risk. They looked at levels from zero to 300. The current recommendations are there'd be less than 200 what is it? I think micrograms per liter or something like that. It's very, so they want it less than that. So uh, that's what we know. Are you glad to know you don't have to worry about the aluminum pots? Okay. I Probably half of you came because you've been worried about the, the, the 20 years you cooked with aluminum pots 30 years ago. Yeah. I understand. What about what? Deodorant. Oh, the deodorant. <clears throat> That's not really getting into your system. It's kind of on the outside. I don't know of any association there. Okay? I know we worry about it. <clears throat> um, you may lose some social contact. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay, let's look at protective factors. Things that protect against Alzheimer's. We've already mentioned the omega-3 fats. We mentioned those again, vitamin B12. There are causes of dementia which are, not, which are reversible. Things like B12 deficiency, for example. I would hate to miss something that was reversible. And so when someone has a diagnosis and it looks like they're failing their mini mental status exam and they're, oh, maybe they've got Alzheimer's, always do a bunch of tests to make sure we're not missing something, like a B12 deficiency, because you'd, you'd want to uh, uh, increase that and see if you could help the brain. So we, the B12 tends to be uh, helpful. Believe it or not, the literature reports that brown rice helps to decrease Alzheimer's. I was surprised to find that specific of a food, but somebody has actually checked it and found an association. The more brown rice you eat, the less uh, Alzheimer's you get. It may have something to do with what we call the tocopherols. You all have probably heard of vitamin E, right? There are, it's called a tocopherol, but there are multiple tocopherols that are not exactly vitamins. When you eat food that is, that has fat in it, it's going to come with the, the, that is whole food, it's going to come with tocopherols to help protect the fats from being destroyed in the plant. That's the way God has designed it. These tocopherols are free radical scavengers and tend to be protective to our brains as well. So that may be part of where this brown rice connection comes from, although many other foods, like nuts, for example, have the uh, tocopherols as well. We found, we thought vitamin E was protective against heart disease, for example, and so we started giving people supplements of vitamin E. We found it in epidemiologic studies. We said, how much vitamin E are they eating? We found people that were eating more vitamin E tend to have fewer heart attacks. When they went back to look a little more carefully and said, okay, now let's give them a vitamin E pill to take, didn't work. Didn't work nearly as well. Doesn't, what, what's happening is vitamin E is simply a marker in the foods for all these tocopherols which are so beneficial for us. It's better to eat the whole foods than to take the pill. Okay, more protective factors. Believe it or not, this has been studied. Quality of life and spirituality make a difference. Now there's a little cartoon at the bottom here. It's a sign found in the front of a church. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. 
<laughs> That's the United Methodist Church. I, I'm sure it's not uh, denominationally specific. It was just the bulletin secretary, I think, that missed the humor in that one. But the higher quality of life, the more spiritual connections you have, going to church makes a difference and helps decrease your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And mental activity, some fascinating stuff looking at uh, really large groups of people doing some sort of mental activity, whether it's reading or dancing or playing a musical instrument or board games, one time per week there was a 7% decrease in Alzheimer's disease. If it was 11 days per month, there was a 63% decrease. So you can see there's a kind of a volume to this. What can you do with your brain to keep it active? You know, you can't send your brain out to do push-ups. You exercise your brain by learning something new, by doing something with your brain. Uh, crossword puzzles, you probably have heard of this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, quotes, a mental activity like thinking about words or playing games. It can be something like learning a new skill, a new physical skill, like uh, try brushing your teeth with your left hand. <laughs> I mean, your, your brain's having to learn something, so it has to work at that, you see? I would not recommend learning to skateboard if you've got gray hair. <laughs> but that would work, too, if you didn't break a hip or a crack your head open on the way. Learn something new. Um, and as you do that, you're, of course, strengthening your brain. You're using those cells. You're helping to increase their energy demands. And by doing that, you're decreasing the likelihood that you will get uh, Alzheimer's. Something like 30% uh, of the calories that we eat go to our brain. Can you imagine? It's, our brain is a much smaller part of our body, but the brain does use a lot of calories. So use it. Sitting there and staring into space, some people have called it vegetating. Others call it simply watching TV. Okay. <laughs> and it may not be good for you. <clears throat> Exercise, just exercising significantly decreases the Alzheimer's risk as well. Active exercise on a regular basis, uh, boy, out in the sunshine, you remember something about vitamin D and its importance? It's important for us to keep active. Now, this is interesting. Your education level tends to make a difference. Uh, the more education you have, that is, the more you've used your brain, and we assume the more you continue using your brain, the less likely you are to get Alzheimer's as well. Hey, that's an idea. Why not go back and get a degree? You know, going to school with gray hair, there are lots of people who do it. It's great for your brain. And then social support, which is extremely important, which may be a reason why you should use that uh, deodorant. <laughs> Just a suggestion. <clears throat> but social support is very helpful. The more connected you are, uh, the less isolated, why the more brain, I mean, you're going to be talking to people as you're talking and interacting, you're using brain cells. And it, the principle, you're beginning to see it, aren't you? The more you use it, the better off you're going to be. More protective factors. Believe it or not, fruits and vegetables seem to be protective from a, a dietary standpoint. Retinoic acid, again, this is uh, uh, related to vitamin A, so that would be the, the, uh, like the orange-type uh, vegetables, squash, carrots, those types of things. Quercetin, uh, this is in, uh, there's a lot of it in apples. Apples have a lot of it. Quercetin has been found to be associated with decreased risk of Alzheimer's. Extremely powerful antioxidant helping to take care of those free radicals. This is the stuff in the purple grapes. And uh, uh, so you've, you've probably uh, heard about it before. <coughs> curcumin. Now, curcumin is the active ingredient in uh, turmeric. It's a spice, extremely powerful as far as antioxidants are concerned. It's been tried, and uh, it looks like m it makes a difference, at least in the mouse model, in helping to keep away the Alzheimer's disease. Those of you who were here when we talked about aging, remember the importance of caloric restriction. You already heard me say that by calorically restricting, you increase the efficiency in the body, 
you're, you actually, the, the mice, for example, keep their brain function much longer, and uh, it appears the same for humans as well. Too many calories mean you're gaining weight, you're getting closer towards diabetes. If you restrict the calories, you're losing weight, you're moving away from diabetes, and you're moving away from Alzheimer's disease. Another reason to keep those calories low. And then this is kind of interesting. Some people really push for uh, distilled water. Maybe some of you have uh, distilleries it's fascinating that water that is, comes from the ground often has something in it called silicates. And silicates, you've heard it, right? It has something to do with glass. They get silicates, they make glass out of it. But the more silicates in the water, the, the less Alzheimer's disease. So that's kind of an interesting one. I'm not sure it's best for us to highly purify our water. Uh, we want to make sure that it's safe and free from toxic things and E. coli and those types of things. But, uh, you know, good spring water is uh, still good water. And silicates in the water tends to make a difference. Okay, <clears throat> here it is. You've seen it. I, I'll have biscuits and gravy. And uh, take it easy on the gravy? Uh, no, on the lecture about the gravy. <laughs> New menus. <clears throat> yep, they just arrived this morning. Uh, there are quite a few additional uh, additions for your dining pleasure. And the little heart symbols are for good cholesterol items. Very impressive. Uh, Roz, just one question. Why are the little ambulance symbols next to all the stuff I like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, if people already have Alzheimer's disease, what can you do to help them? What we've talked about for preventing Alzheimer's may be beneficial. I mean, it certainly makes sense to move in that direction. I know I've cared for some people with Alzheimer's disease, and we put them into a lifestyle change, and I've seen their function improve. For example, uh, well, uh, one fellow who had been a physician, uh, for several years we went on a lifestyle change, his wife called me back a couple months later and said he's actually taking part in our family worship now. And he wasn't, he was just sitting there before. So we, uh, we've seen some improvement from lifestyle changes. As we've talked about, whole foods, exercise, working on using your brain. But this is what we learned from the literature as far as how to help people who, are, who have Alzheimer's. Number one is sleep. Getting them on a good sleep hygiene program can significantly improve their function. And there are programs to help with that. That is, uh, people who are, especially in nursing homes, for example, will get night and day turnaround. They wake up at the night and they, they get confused and combative. Then they go to kind of sleep in the day or sit in their chair and kind of hunch over. If we can get that turned around so they're sleeping at night and awake during the day, uh, th that can make a uh, significant difference. Light can make a big difference. If you, and this makes sense, really. If you're in a dark room all day sitting in a chair doing this, you're losing touch. Just bringing light into the eyes, taking the person out, outdoors in the, in the bright light, and it doesn't have to be outdoors, but get the bright light during the day to help reset the brain. Uh, acupressure has been demonstrated to be beneficial uh, as... Uh, well as aromatherapy uh, using lavender. These are things from the literature that people have tried. The, I think the aromatherapy was something like uh, a lavender sort of a thing and the hand was kind of massaged at the same time. It was input to the brain, if you will, for the folks with Alzheimer's. And these are things that are reported to be beneficial. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there are medications which can help. None of them reverse the disease. They only slow the progression. So uh, especially the cholinesterase inhibitors tend to have some side effects uh, which concern me, but yet they can be helpful in slowing down the process. Spending time on the medications is not our uh, purpose this evening. Uh, Namenda, uh, the NMDA receptor antagonist, seems to be one of the better ones and can be used in combination with uh, one of the first ones. Now, this is fascinating. 
If amyloid is building up and it's getting to the brain from the blood, it's, apparently that happens, it's in the blood, what would happen if we made a vaccine against the amyloid? Fascinating study was tried on this. It was actually stopped early because 6% of the people who got the vaccine had a brain inflammation response, really bad, and they, it, it made them get worse. They, so they stopped the study. You know, they kind of, the way they do these studies, some people get a vaccine and some people don't. There's a placebo. They watch them kind of going forward. And those that, were, that got the vaccine, there was 6% of them had this severe brain inflammation. So they stopped the study, but they continued to watch the people who had gotten the immunization. And the fascinating thing was that over time, those people did very well. So if we could find a way to, to uh, uh, do the vaccine for the amyloid without causing the inflammation in the 6%, well, this could be helpful. It's not available now, but uh, it would be nice if we could find an answer for that. And then uh, there's a, a new medication called Fluorazan, which is in uh, promising uh, kind of stage three trials. Uh, there are other medications that are anti-amyloid, and you can see several kind of groups of them. Uh, these are being worked on. Nothing is right here, ready to go now, but just to let you know that science is working on these things, working on the process. I'd like to see them do more on the lifestyle earlier in life. That'd be my uh, uh, preference. Okay, what's the summary? <clears throat> Live a healthy lifestyle throughout your life. Might as well start the kids out young, don't you think? Why would you want to get your kids uh, started on junk food that's the, what's going to make up their habits in midlife, right? And their midlife is going to decide their Alzheimer's. With what's happening in our culture today, I'm hearing it said, we're going to be, this is going to be the first generation where the kids die before their parents. It's just, we need to start young. So uh, we need to move towards a healthy lifestyle. The Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle tends to be protective. And as you've been here, you've heard us talk about the plant-based nutrition exercise, sunlight, put it all together, uh, lots of good water, and that tends to be helpful. Keep active physically and mentally, and last but not least, be thankful. So that covers it. What questions do you have? Oh, you're back on that... Uh, Nemenda, write down the name of the medication, N-E-M-E-N-D-A, Nemenda, and uh, it's something that can, that can help. Yes? What's your thoughts about baby aspirin? A baby aspirin, I don't remember seeing anything in my review of the literature as to whether it helps Alzheimer's. We know that it helps to decrease the clotting, so it would tend to be something that would be helpful, but I don't remember seeing anything on it. Good question. You mentioned You want it dark when you're sleeping, that's right. You don't want the light at night, you want the light in the daytime, and then you want it dark at night. It helps people get back on a regular cycle, uh, helps with the serotonin, melatonin, people just do better. So that makes sense. Yes? I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. Um, has there been a dramatic increase in Alzheimer's, or are we just hearing more about it, or it's been... <clears throat> yeah, that's a, big, a good question. Is, is Alzheimer's increasing? Or are we just hearing about it more? You know, as we get older, we know more and more people who get Alzheimer's because we're all getting older together. So there's that little bit of bias. But it's my understanding that uh, the, the Alzheimer's has actually been going up as we see these chronic diseases. Well, we would think that it would be lifestyle. Uh, I've been kind of showing you the kind of the lifestyle issues, and they seem to be they're there. They're, there's a connection. Yes? Can you talk about a genetic or inherited factor? <clears throat> a genetic or inherited factor. There must be, but you saw I pulled from the literature, what was it about, was it 64 percent that was probably reversible or we could control?
probably the rest of that, or the rest of that may be uh, genetic, or it may be other lifestyle factors that we haven't identified yet. There may be a genetic piece there. I would like to think that if we chose to live correctly, like diabetes, for example, you don't have to get diabetes even though you have the genetic predisposition. If you choose, that's type 2 diabetes, if you choose a lifestyle that's active and you don't eat a, too much, okay? There was another hand I saw. Yes? What is the best thing for insomnia? What is the best thing for insomnia? <laughs> the best treatment for insomnia is sleep. <laughs> what if you can't sleep? Well, we talk about sleep hygiene, okay? And it's obvious that, that when we approach sleep, there are some things that make it hard to sleep. If you, for example, uh, drink coffee, especially later in the day, it's going to keep you awake. If you do really heavy exercise shortly before you go to bed, that's not going to help at all. Uh, if, well, let's talk about things that can help sleep. Taking medications to sleep, yes, people get addicted to the sleeping medications. It's much better to use good sleep hygiene. The recommendations are for the sleeping pills, they should not be used more than 15 days out of a month. So at least it's every other day. When they're used every day, the brain gets dependent on them. It interferes with REM sleep, so you don't get the dream work taken care of. It's, you're not as, I want to be careful here, mentally balanced. Okay, uh, if you're not getting your REM sleep. So it's best to use good sleep hygiene. Plenty of light during the day, especially early in the day, late in the afternoon helps to suppress the melatonin in the brain when the light is there and then it rebounds later. So that's uh, uh, helpful. Uh, you want to avoid, avoid stimulants. Uh, a, a, a warm bath before bed tends to help, keeping it quiet. Uh, don't do other things in bed. I mean, there's a whole uh, thing about uh, sleep and sleep hygiene. Oh, I see lots of hands, and I, I saw the one over here first, so I'll come back over. I'd like to go back to uh, fighting cholesterol. Yes. Uh, I've tried various things, uh, but I get back to the statins. Uh -huh. And believe me, I lost a lot of muscle tissue. Uh, I've done Lovastatin, Crestor, uh, Zopar was the worst. So, so the, uh, you've, had, you've had a cholesterol problem, taking the statins, which you thought, we learned, might help the Alzheimer's, but some people have really bad reactions. Interestingly enough, there's, it's not unheard of, but relatively rare. Sometimes people lose their memory on statins. They'll just, I can't remember. Uh, so that's been reported as well. But because of its anti-inflammatory effects, it seems to, in a large group of people, decrease the number that will get uh, Alzheimer's disease. Yes, ma'am. How do you increase your HDL? Well, exercise is, uh, is good. Uh, managing stress, that is, and we've talked about this a little bit, trying to keep a thankful, positive attitude tends to help it increase. Uh, estrogen helps it go up. Does that help? You know about estrogen? Yeah. And uh, avoiding trans fats. Yes, I think I saw your hand next. Yes, I'm um, suggesting that the study of the scriptures is one way to uh, avoid... The study of scripture and the memorizing of scripture. Yes. yes. Because if you're studying it, you're always learning something new. And one Christian author says there's nothing so calculated as to strengthen the intellect. Yeah. yeah. The more you do to strengthen your intellect, the less likely you are to get Alzheimer's. Uh, another thing I would like to try sometime is um, going on uh, up to the top of Mount Sinai and talking to God. I wonder what happened to Moses. But, but God's very presence must be healing, if you will. Okay, I, there was another hand here. Yeah, this um, pylori, pylori Helio Helioactor pylori. Yes, the Heliobacter pylori. If you, have an, if you have an ulcer and you're not taking things like aspirin or ibuprofen, there's a real good chance that it's caused by an infection caused by Heliobacter pylori. Most of us get it when we're very young as kids from really bad hygiene. 
and the germ just kind of grows in there and it will uh, kind of overgrow, if you will, and increases your risk of uh, not just ulcers but also cancer in the stomach. But that increases inflammation in the body. Yes, there is a test. We can do a stool test or a blood test to identify it and then treat it. So that's something worth doing if you have ulcer symptoms. Yes? Uh, a natural remedy you mean for Heliobacter or for Alzheimer's? I, I know nothing about galantamine. It may be, I just haven't seen it. Yes, ma'am. My husband and I, we took the runs over home. We have basically the same diet. My HDL is equal to that of my husband. Yes. Yeah. The HDL, she says, at home, they eat the same thing, and hers is high and his is low. Females tend to run a little higher. So that's one thing. And there is a genetic component. Some of us, you know, that, those things tend to bounce around. I've showed you an association. The higher the HDL, the lower the likelihood of getting an Alzheimer's. A low HDL does not mean you are going to get Alzheimer's. It's just an association. Yes, ma'am. I just want to thank you because I have so much problems with insomnia. You have helped me thank my calcium and magnesium. Good. I'm glad that your sleep is getting better. That's good. Yes, sir. I don't think so, but I cannot tell you for sure. That was not addressed in the article, and the monomeric is the stuff that's not connected to anything. In the baking powder, it is connected to something. So I don't think so, but I cannot say for sure. Okay? <clears throat> okay, one last hand, and then we're going to wrap it up. I've heard that. It was, it was not mentioned in anything that I uh, read here, so I, and I can't tell you uh, for sure. I would, uh, I would hope that it could help your memory as far as whether it would hold off uh, Alzheimer's or not, I, I don't know. Well, it's been fun. Thank you for being a, uh, a great audience, uh, and I trust that you'll be able to take the information home and use it for your benefit. Good night.